We're over here at Bravo Base. I'm actually getting ready to get out of here, but um, I'm going to um, introduce you to Juan Carlos. Um, for those of you who were tagging me in that letter from the governor, um, this is the gentleman that governor had wrote in that letter about. And uh, How long have you been giving um, haircuts to the homeless? Uh, since October of last year here in Tucson. Um, what what have you um, gained um, just from going out to uh, give free haircuts to those that, you know, really use them and appreciate it? Uh, just a connection. Yeah, showing love uh, to each other. Uh, you know, it could be me. Uh, that's how I feel it. You know, I've been homeless myself. I've, you know, I've been on the streets. Uh, I know how it is. I know how hard it could be. I've been locked up, you know. Uh, I come from a small town, so it's uh, pretty important. How did it feel when um, uh, so many families um, flooded the governor with letters and support of, you know, you should have the ability to go out and not be penalized and, you know, give free haircuts to the poor? I felt, I felt really, I felt relieved because I thought for a second there that they were going to stop me for indefinitely, you know, I thought it wasn't going to be able to happen. As a matter of fact, I got, I got pretty depressed, to be honest with you. So this is like, um, you know, we're in our program, um, our biggest, one of our words that uh, we always use as a bu buzzword is purpose. So this is kind of like your purpose. It gives you purpose to come out and do this. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I feel I feel strongly about helping, uh, helping each other out. I think it's really important, especially now more than ever. There's a lot of people that are homeless. And, uh, you know, it could be me. And that's just, that's how I see it every time I come out here, you know. Um, I think everybody deserves to feel good about themselves, no matter what their situation is. And so uh, my mission is to help people feel good about themselves. Because for a while there, you know, uh, I struggled a lot with a self-esteem issue. So if there's anything I can do to help people feel good about themselves, uh, I'll do it. And having the skill, you know, you don't, you don't need to have a, a, this skill to help people. You just have to, you know, want it and go out and help people. And just just so happens that I'm a barber, you know. So it just so happens I know how to cut hair, and uh, it just so happens that you know my grandfather and my six of my uncles are uh, army veterans. So that's what I'm doing here today: is giving back in, the, in their memory and hanging out with these good people. Let the video explain the rest. Now, when his Regency Beauty School closed its doors, he 
felt compelled to offer up his services for free, but now he found out the Arizona State Board of Cosmetology is investigating a complaint filed against him. I reached out to the board by phone tonight to get more answers. But even though he wasn't getting compensation from for the haircuts, I then talked to their executive director, who declined to comment on this because it's an active investigation. But she told me they stand by the words written in the state statute that say, in part, a person shall not perform or attempt to perform cosmetology without a license or practice in any place other than in a license salon. Juan Carlos said he wasn't aware of this regulation and is worried that the haircuts he offered for free could not cost him his future in cosmetology. They can suspend my, even before I even try to get a license, they can say no. Uh, and that would be very, very unfortunate. to study uh, cosmetology um, about a year ago after my mom passed away. Um, my mom was a real uh, influence in my life um, and she she got cancer and uh, she lost all her hair. So that's uh, why uh, I came to Tucson to you know better my life and um, get an opportunity to uh, help other people as well because my mom was really big about uh, helping other people so I signed up for uh, beauty school at Regency, um, did really well there, and uh, unfortunately they closed uh, from one day to the next. You know, we got a text message uh, saying that, you know, our school is going to be shut down and that we needed to get our stuff the next day. So I was really devastated about that. Um, and about a year ago, uh, I heard about Hope Fest, which uh, is about giving back to our community. Uh, initially, I wanted to become a public health nurse, um, but due to some choices that I made, wasn't able to. Um, and uh, so I started helping out uh, in the community. I started going to the parks as a student, still at Regency, um, prior to their closing, and uh, did Hope Fest uh, in 2016 and helped with haircuts there, and I really liked what I did. I met a mom who had cancer. Um, one of my beauty school friends was just starting out, and she had a friend who had who had just been diagnosed with it. Um, and so she wasn't emotionally ready to take a client that was suffering from cancer at the time because it was hard. It's a, it's a hard it's a hard topic. It's a hard subject. Um, and so um, you know, I did her hair and stuff. I cut her. I cut that woman's hair and. Uh, you know, it was amazing. And ever since then, I've just been, uh, you know, I've been going and going to Santa Rita Park, going to uh, de Agosto. Um, it's crazy because I was telling John a while ago that Bainte de Agosto in Spanish is my, uh, is my birthday in English. So August 20th, isn't that crazy? Um, I, uh, I got a call from the board after my uh, institute closed down. Um, from the investigator um, who told me that I was under investigation because of the fact that I was a student and apparently um, I didn't know um, that we're not allowed to help people for free. We're not allowed to do charity for free. We're not allowed to, um, you're not allowed to cut your child's hair without a license. Um, that's what, what, what that's what we found out, and um, so you know a lot of moms and a lot of parents were upset. A lot of families, the BOP family, you know John McLean, his family, our community got together and you know called the board, made phone calls, and um, 
governor found out about it. So they had called me um, and they told me, you know, I told her, I told her the truth. I said, uh, I, I helped organize an event. I've been doing this since October of 2016 out in my community. Um, and uh, I, I know that I don't have a license, but I'm going to school for it and I have a really big passion for it. And I also have a big passion for our veterans because my family is, you know, mainly consists of veterans. My two grandparents, my two grandfathers, they served in the Korean War, and um, six of my uncles, my grandma had 10 kids, so six of my uncles uh, were in the uh, Vietnam, and I always knew I was gonna you know, be a part of helping veterans. I just didn't know how, I didn't know if it was gonna be nursing, I didn't even know if it was gonna be, you know, I didn't know. To be honest with all of you, this wasn't, um, this wasn't my initial career choice. Um, initial career choice was to be a nurse, but God works in mysterious ways, and sometimes he works in really obvious ways, and it's hard to um, ignore it. When you know, I've been through a lot of, a lot, I've been through the worst, especially losing my mom and a lot of my family members as well, um, to drugs and suicide as well. Um, I was really humbled when I found out that the uh, Arizona governor, uh, actually his office called me um, and made a lot of headlines. And uh, I was really happy, I cried a lot. I thought that um, I thought that I was never ever gonna be able to get my license, you know? Um, and for that whole week when I was under investigation, all I did was pray, to be honest. That's all I did. And I prayed and I prayed and I'm here standing now. Um, you know, I've been through the worst. I've, I've been in prison, I've been in jail. Um, and it feels really good to stand here today and share with you guys exactly I do what I do. Because a lot of uh, veterans are being forgotten. A lot of people, a lot of our soldiers come home with not only injuries, but emotional problems. And a lot, and we see a lot of them on the streets. And a lot, and sometimes we don't know that they're even veterans because we turn we turn around and we don't acknowledge it. But if we took five minutes out of our day to help somebody, whether if it's a haircut, if it's a dollar, a ride, bus fare, I've learned to to be more open and to love other people and to give back. And right now, currently, I um, I got a call about like in February, March, from the governor's office telling me that um, it's okay to do what I do. And uh, the Institute for Justice as well it has got my back, so I am still providing uh, haircuts for any veteran um, for free. Uh, I, I'm base barber at VOP, and they have allowed me to. Uh, they have allowed me to you know, do their hair, and they're, they're my practice dummies, and I'm getting better every day. You can ask T over there, back there. I, I never even, uh, I never even had practiced on uh, ethnic hair before, but I got it right. So I'm doing something right, and I want to thank each and every one of you guys for supporting me in my mission and um, send send the veterans my way. I am actually working with the uh, Department of Economic Security and uh, o, uh, local other organizations to help my tuition. Um, which I'm really happy about. I got a letter this weekend, so it looks like my barber school will be fully paid for. I'm really happy about that. And the guys at VOP uh, set me up a barber spot, and I got chairs, I have everything I need. And I'm really, really grateful that my community is here for me because I'm here for you guys 100%. Thank you. Um, I guess if anybody have any questions? I had one in my head, but it, it, it jumped out. Nobody, nobody have any questions about the amazing story of. of I, one thing I did want to say. Shortly, like after, like you were saying, the um, families, veteran families, made phone calls. People made phone calls for you. You actually, the governor wrote a letter 
it was pretty public. It was on Tucson News Now. They did a story about it. So um, yeah, it's, it's really good to see. And I, I thank you personally for stay, s stepping up and putting your neck on the line where a lot of people may not have to uh, kind of iron out this issue because this is just one of the many issues where you know, you're not allowed to give away free stuff. It doesn't make any sense. Today is Memorial Day, and a lot of uh, a lot of companies like to give out ha free haircuts to veterans on Veterans Day and Memorial Day. But I do it every day, so I just want you guys to know that if there's ever a veteran that is in need or family members, come and see me at base. I love you guys. Maintaining nearby property. 
here they remove trash and debris from a trackside ravine. Well, I haven't found any bullets or anything yet, so that's a good thing. They work for state really. They'll have various job tasks assigned to them, and they'll have the bullets and things that they need to do. Through donations from the public, they have enough supplies to share with folks outside the camp, and they do every day. Well, snacks are in there, some peanut butter, some of that the only good stuff like that. We love that stuff. Thank you. Hey, you're very welcome. You guys take care of it. Anybody that needs food can come here and get it. I mean, right now we're preparing to work with 200 food boxes a week. That's not preparing. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, thank you for letting me know. What began with just a few tents more than a year ago has grown both in size and organization. Camp Bravo has become a refuge for many, but memories of life without shelter or protection are close. It was daily uncertainty, not knowing where you're going to get your next meal, not knowing where you're going to spend the night the next night, where it's going to be safe, not knowing that somebody's going to come up and plug you in the head while you're sleeping and steal a little bit of the long as you can. stage the, uh, the man, the myth, the legend that is behind that base and um, a couple others prior to that one, or actually I believe one other prior to that one here in Tucson. Um, his name is Lewis Arthur. He is the founder of Veterans on Patrol and Walking for the Forgotten Ministry. We hand a round of applause for Lewis Arthur. How's it going, everybody? Um, John, when John first approached me um, about the panel discussion that we were going to have again in the city, um, obviously, you know, and he knows, uh, when it comes to going out to talk to um, experts and panels and city officials and bureaucrats, I, I honestly believe in my heart, 99% of your time is wasted. Um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these meetings, we have people that are boxed with their own ideas. Um, you know, there's a platform that's presented um, through nonprofit organizations. And uh, when we first started living with the homeless, well, first let me go back here to August uh, um, 21st. Next month uh, is 22 months when I left my home to live with the homeless in Phoenix. And I was looking for homeless veterans specifically because we had politicians going out on television, uh, Mayor Greg Stanton, John McCain, our First Lady Michelle Obama had come down. Um, and they had this big media event where they stated that there are no more homeless veterans living in Phoenix. Now, I was living with them on a 22-day walkabout when all of this was being said on the media, and I was literally seeing so many people who could be helped, but there wasn't anyone around them to help them. Um, and living with them was the only way we were ever going to find out how to help them. Um, uh, my approach is unique. I operate the only SSO that's functioning in the nation. It's a self-sacrificing organization, which means our Christian ministry does not take money. Um, you don't tie it to our church. There's no money exchange whatsoever. Removing the money, we removed all the government regulation. We operate under the Good Samaritan Law. Um, I violate camping ordinances and public land trespassing laws all the time. There is no law on the books that, that I believe um, should be followed if it prevents you from giving someone food, from giving someone medical care, from giving someone a safe place to sleep. Uh, I have a lot of radical ideas, and uh, they're radical because it's the exact opposite of what everyone else has been doing. Um, we can sit here and we can blame uh, law enforcement for targeting homeless. We can blame the VA for failing the homeless veterans. We can blame our social service providers out there for not getting 
out of their offices and actually onto the streets with their outreach teams to find these guys and take care of them. We can blame the city. We can blame our neighbor who's not paying attention. Or we can step up and say, we're going to do the job ourselves. And there's enough people here, right here, just, just with this group right here. If everyone in this room went out and did one thing nice for someone else in our city, if everyone just in this room, one thing nice, you find a person who needs help, needs a prayer, needs a hug, they need food, standing on a corner, getting five bucks for something to eat, one thing nice, and it starts a ripple effect. It starts a ripple effect. Um, I don't really want to talk a whole lot about our program other than say if you want to see it in action, go out there. Uh, recently, um, we modified our program. I built it around our experiences on the ground. So we didn't make a program manual and go out there and execute the manual. We went out there and executed helping people and then we wrote our program manual. And it's very flexible. Uh, right now, we run the only homeless veteran encampment that's actually ran by homeless veterans. Uh, there are no volunteers outside who's not homeless other than myself who has any veto power on that camp. The homeless are in charge of that camp. When you see in that video, you don't see myself, you don't see any of my volunteers. Every person you see featured in that video is a homeless individual. And I had asked Tom when he came to do the story to specifically focus on their stories. We're always going to be out here. We are always going to be out here because there's always going to be homeless individuals out here. But when we stop talking about homelessness as if it's a problem, because it's not, uh, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was homeless, and I don't think he was a problem. You're never going to eradicate it, so stop talking about all this money we're going to spend to end homelessness. It's not a problem. They're people. And I've, I've always believed in my heart, and this proves it, is that if we provide them a safe place with no agenda, and we provide them with the material support that they need, and we put them in charge of themselves, as crazy as it seems, watch how many of them will pull their own homeless brothers and sisters out of that ditch and put them into a home. Now, Bravo's been operating under homeless command for two months, and their average right now is they are housing three individuals per week. We are housing veterans at a faster rate. We are partnered with the BA, Building 90, Andrew Young, Kessler's, they come out, Red Cross comes out, Project Action Veterans comes out, and the Prima Bear Foundation comes out. CBI is one of our biggest supporters. They come out continuously. So now you have a central hub, and this is a tent city. Okay, there are laws all across America right now where they're saying you can't just pitch a tent and make a camp in the city for homeless people. Um, and I don't believe that that's the solution, is to make a law to prevent us from doing something that obviously works. Uh, none of this is possible without people, without you. It's not me. It's not my volunteers that have been out here for almost two years. It, it's every single person who actually cared. I have met so many people where I look at their Facebook, for example, and you would see years of political posts, it's left versus right, it's blame Obama, it's blame Bush, it's la la la. I go to so many families who stopped by and they saw that homeless veteran outside McDonald's and they took him in and got something to eat. Or they drove furniture over to a vet who just got his apartment. And you don't even have to be a vet. Because um, one of the biggest kickbacks we have against our program is we take civilians. But I've always believed you don't go into the homeless community and pick favorites. And a lot of our veterans, uh, their civilian friends out there have been living with them, have been sleeping with them, have struggled to find food with them, have been battling addictions with them. And I don't think separating them is the best way to handle that problem. So Bravo does help civilians. If a civilian comes to our camp and they want to work and work our program, they got to work twice as hard as the veterans, but you're in a pretty good encampment and you have a chance to get off of the streets. Um, I just want to touch one thing, and I think it really hurts our homeless community, and that is the divide and the rift we have between our first responders, our fire department, our EMTs, and our Tucson Police Department officials. Um, as radical as some people say, and I understand a lot of people, there are bad cops out there. But there are also cops that pick up your homeless brothers and sisters, and instead of throwing them into your city jail, they're drunk, they're bringing them over to our camp.
and we're putting them in our medical unit and we're letting them sleep off their intoxication. And then when they wake up, we feed them, you need food, clothes, and even if they go back out and do the same thing, they're not going into jail. They're not getting sucked into the system. I've seen changes made within law enforcement community because they've been coming out to the camp and they're meeting and talking to the homeless. And the reason why they're looking at it different is because they're seeing all these citizens that are standing up around us and we're treating them as if they aren't second-class citizens. And it's an eye-opener. Whereas law enforcement sent out to ticket, fine, and harass, we've been requesting for quite some time right now for um, the community to step up and ask for the city, why don't we make a good Samaritan fund? Because I'm going to tell you, I know over 40 officers right now in Tucson Police Department that if you would make a Good Samaritan Fund or 51% of their fines from revenue generation, tickets, uh, citations, if they would take 51% of that, put a Good Samaritan Fund for that officer, I know police officers who would go out there, pull over that guy with a broken taillight instead of writing him a ticket, drive him to AutoZone, give him the money he needs to fix that taillight. We don't give law enforcement an opportunity to come into our community because our city continues to use them as bullies. And until we step in and reach out, and if they're coming in with clubs, I'm sorry, reach out with a hug sometimes and you'll change their mind. And if we get hit over the head, we're a strong enough community. Veterans on patrol, I tell everyone, we don't tolerate any law enforcement officer. If they're gonna go out and target um, the homeless, it's BS. We faced arrest several times because they were going to bulldoze a camp and we stood there in front of them and said, you have to arrest us first. And that's not me saying that. There's news media stories of several police standoffs. We're fighting against each other. And we're talking about a problem, which isn't a problem, because homeless people are not a problem, they're people. When we get that disconnect and we remove it and we start reaching across the aisle, and you'll see Tucson Fire Department just came out, they're doing their blanket drive again. You guys know last winter they came out and we had thousands of blankets and the law enforcement in this city and the first responders, firefighters, EMTs, came out to our camp for an entire week. We're loading their trucks up with all those FEMA blankets that got distributed last winter, okay? They didn't get any media recognition. Okay, there's no one out there saying, hey, look, there's actually police officers and firefighters who care about the homeless because it's not a good news story. What we want to do is to give them more opportunities to come and help us. And then we want the homeless community to reach out with law enforcement. There are, there are bad neighborhoods where we have women being raped. If, law, if the homeless could trust law enforcement, um, you would have a lot less rapes with the homeless women out there because they'd be able to go and talk to the law enforcement officer and not fear some type of repercussion. Um, there's certain areas where we're killing ourselves. And if we could just fill those gaps, think outside the box, we can change a lot of lives. We're not gonna save everyone. We're not meant to save everyone. But one person at a time, that's, that's what I honestly believe. And I thank every single one, my God first and foremost for myself, um, and everyone who served here that are veterans in this building today. Um, I don't celebrate Memorial Day. I have a lot of Gold Star moms. Every family you see represented on these 22 ribbons are veterans we've lost to suicide on this side of the soil. And this isn't a day of celebration for them. Um, for me, it's another day of service. We have our teams right now monitoring Facebook. If we have any veteran in Tucson who's hitting a rabbit hole tonight, it's a hard day for them. We're ready. We'll go out. We'll find them. We'll extract them. We'll get them to our camp. We'll take care of them. Um, and it's everyday service. And that's what we're going to need. Um, that's what we're going to eventually need is more people that are going to step up and say, I'm going to do this every day. And fortunately for us, we've uh, got a 70% homeless veteran volunteer in our organization, which means seven out of 10 of my volunteers are homeless, still homeless. So a lot of the people we've housed still come back and volunteer, but I'm talking homeless volunteers for our count, seven out of 10. And our goal is to continue to give them the tools, the skills, the supplies, whatever they need to lead themselves because they know how to take care, better care of themselves, as most of you know, than any of us. I've been living with them for almost two years. I still ain't figured them out. I love them to death, but there's just so many different areas in this community that you're never gonna figure it out, but you guys can. And you guys can take care of each other. 
And our goal is to keep finding places. We're looking to establish more camps in the city so we can provide. I've got a platform for the mentally ill. We've got a platform for the domestic violence, the women who are being raped and beaten. And, you know, there's lies, some of you know, there's a lot of bad stuff to go on in these streets at nighttime. We got a lot of great ideas, but it takes people to put those ideas into practice. So the minute we start, uh, stop. The minute we stop talking about the politicians who are failing us, the law enforcement who are bullying us, the, the VA who's not treating us right, it doesn't matter. The minute we stop complaining and pointing our fingers at them and start doing and solving the problem ourselves, they're obsolete. They're impotent. The city of Tucson hasn't really been able to move in and hurt Bravo Camp for almost two years. And we have a tent city there. There's no permits there. You know, and you have over 300 individuals just in Tucson alone who's transitioned through our camp. They're not always great stories, but understand, we go out and we look for the worst of the worst. I look for chronic homeless veterans who are homeless 10 or more years. I look for the ones with the heaviest addiction problems, be they meth, crack, heroin. I look for the ones that no one else is going to look for. That's what I go out and look for. I look for these hardest people, the ones that have nobody. Because I've been there before. I've been on that street. I've been one of those hard people. And so many people reached out to me and I never grabbed that lifeline. They weren't reaching out to me in a way that could relate to me. I've been able to learn in all the areas of how people could relate to me to find ways that I can relate to those who have no one out there. And there are a bunch of them out there in our city right now. We have veterans that we don't know about still sleeping on our streets. And when we move past the discussions and asking the city to help us and just go out and take care of them ourselves, that's affecting change. And that means something. And no one can take away that blessing from you. When you give to someone else with no agenda in your heart other than to give and to help, there isn't a pill you can make, there isn't a law you can write, there isn't a program you can fund that is going to achieve what your genuine compassion for that individual will achieve. Uh, and if you have any questions about uh, what we do, I'll turn the floor over to you right now. So. All right, round of applause for the Okay, so any questions? Yes, right. So what about the general homeless people who come here camping after help? Are they treated with the same respect as the veterans? When you have a homeless community encampment, you're going to have um, every personality you can imagine. At Bravo Base right now, I have military sexual trauma, I have traumatic brain injury, I have post-traumatic stress disorder, I have civilians with mental illness, I have unmedicated individuals who aren't taking their medication. Um, unfortunately, no one's always going to be treated or happy uh, with the treatment they receive when they go to any shelter or any encampment. I'll never be able to change that. But one thing that we always do and we've done, um, Tattoo Rob, as most of you know, Robert Anderson, he just fell off again, but everyone gave up on him. And how many times when he was in his drug addiction would he come to our camps and rob and steal? What did we do? When he was ready for help, we helped him. So if the individual comes in and they have a problem and they're not ready to receive help, there's not much we can do. If they come in and they want to receive help and they want to help themselves, there's nothing we won't do to try to help them. Okay, as a side note, I want to ask a question. Um, so when a vet comes there uh, initially, like what's the, I know it's situation to situation, but what have you seen like um, on a regular is the best service to to offer him and what like you know if I tell him okay this service is available it's going to be available every time um well when the veterans come uh they're more apt to receive help from the service providers uh when there's no strings attached so one of the services we provide is our we're the only shelter first off uh, the only shelter that I know of, if you have a medical card you can smoke on the property I have veterans I know it's no drug and alcohol but I have veterans who go through a harm reduction model and there are a lot of drink in their tents. I try to design the lowest demand shelter for the ones who are on the streets at night because other shelters have rules and regulations that just some people aren't willing to accept. And um, one thing you'll have at uh, 
uh, Bravo is freedom. You don't have a breathalyzer being stuffed in your face when you come on base. You don't have a check-in, check-out time. You don't have to show me your ID to get in and out the door. If you're a veteran, you have to show credentials now. Um, but we still help civilians. Uh, it's just freedom, man. It's, it's no government regulation. When I go and I live with some of these guys out in the deserts and I tell them how great my camp is, you know, I'm not lying. I have a beautiful camp. When I tell them I don't work for the government, I tell them I don't take money and I don't get paid, I can take away every excuse they've been using for so many years not to get help. And once we get them into the camp, we get them accustomed to a port john to fresh food every day, food, clothing, medical care is provided. We've, we've got two top neurologists that provide medical care for free at our camp. We've got a, a world-renowned acupuncturist. I love Nancy. She's with Acupuncturist Without Borders. We provide medical services for free at our camp. These are all things that a veteran can benefit from going in there. But we're always going to have people who don't like our program. We're always going to have people who didn't get along with other people. We're going after the worst of the worst as the city sees it. These are the individuals who refuse services. They're nothing but junkies, drug addicts, and criminals. That's the way the city views these individuals. Who can do amazing things because if God can take me from what I used to be and do all this stuff through our work, He can do amazing things with every junkie criminal nobody that's on the streets right now, according to what the city views him as. And I, I really believe that. I see it every day. Okay, no other questions. A round of applause for. Oh, actually, uh, yes. I have a question. I know that you're one of the best that exists. I just sit back here and you're going to tell me about these 22. Um, our ministry was started four and a half years ago. I was doing grief counseling for moms at the 22. Um, these are gold star moms. Uh, these are these are men and women who fought for our country and they came home and they lost their battle, whether it was the untreated traumatic brain injury, over medication from the VA. It was just somewhere along the line they lost their battle and we failed them. Um, the, these families right here are always, always number one in my heart. Um, today's a hard day for them. Uh, Bravo Base is named after Camp Conklin, or it's named Camp Conklin. It's named after Brandon Conklin. Mother is Kyle Barty. She's in North Carolina. She gets up on Facebook every morning to go to that page who's named after her son, who's written is flying on this right here. And she sees people bringing food and water and clothes to homeless veterans. And they, she sees the civilians and the homeless veterans going out in the community and, and picking up trash and intervening in fights and, and trying just to keep peace so no one's getting arrested and going to jail. She sees so many good things. But when she wakes up, she sees her son's name, Conklin. When she goes to that page, Conklin. And it's giving her, our moms, for me, it's giving them something. So when they wake up, they're, they're suffering in silence. You want to talk about the veteran suicide epidemic, we can have a two-hour forum on it because there isn't much. I've been fighting it, she'll tell you, for almost five years. All right? We're losing them. 22 a day, I don't care if it's one a day, but it's more than 22 a day. And the reason why we're losing them is because we're too busy arguing about what the next politician is going to do. We're too busy arguing about Muslim versus Christian versus atheist versus Jew or straight versus gay versus transgender versus bisexual, black, white, brown, red. We're too busy arguing and fighting with each other when I see these soldiers come back and they're not like us. They're not like any of us. If you haven't served, they know that community. Because when you go in a veteran community, it don't matter who you worship. It don't matter what you look like. It don't matter who you voted for. Because that community is going to stand up and take care of each other. And the problem is we the people aren't giving them the tools they need. And we're not putting them in charge of their own hospitals. We're not putting them in charge of their own care. These families, to me, this is what today is about. Because these are 22 names of people who should be standing right here with us helping pull homeless veterans off the streets, but they can't. And we're going to make sure they're not forgotten, and our goal is to keep building camps and keep naming them after them. Why is, it, why is today Memorial Day an appropriate setting for this particular kind of conversation from your well, this isn't a celebration here. We're not sitting here celebrating. Um, and I think this is a good forum to have. Somewhere right here in the city of Tucson, and we are there, there are people that have come together around the cause of uh, veteran issues and homelessness and poverty in general. 
which, you know, taking care of Americans, taking care of our neighbors. Uh, we send them off to fight, then when they come back, they're not taken care of. I think this is highly appropriate for today because right now we have people on watch, monitoring Facebook, looking for veterans having a hard time. We have vehicles out here. You let a phone call come in, you'll see six, seven guys run out there to go save someone. Because we're here acknowledging that there are gaping holes in veteran services and there are gaping holes in our community. And I'm hoping that people take what they learn from here today and see ideas and start talking to your neighbor. Start talking. Don't say thank you for your service. Do something. That's the only way you're going to properly thank them. Serving them every day is the best I can do. But I'm glad to. And, and I love it. And, and I'm telling you, I love, I love them. They're, they're some amazing people. You're homeless veterans. If you guys, some of you don't know, but they're some of the most amazing people. I've learned so much from them. You know, they're leaders and they're survivalists. And they have a lot of talent and skills that you could be using in your community to make your community a better place. And once you reach out and, and grab their hand and drag them in, you're going to start seeing a lot of positive changes. I see it all the time. We put them in charge of that camp. The homeless are running that property. And tell me that doesn't make the city skin crawl, realizing the homeless are running that property. And they're doing a damn good job. And we're going to keep helping them and give them everything they need. Anything else? All right. Big round of applause for Lewis Hurley.
Good morning, everyone, too. I'll probably say it about five more times till everyone comes on board. Do a minute. I'm just going to walk around while you guys are waiting. Show you what's uh, what's happening at camp and some of the work they've been doing. I'm going to come sit by you guys. Maybe I'll just talk and I'll make him look at him. It's a lot prettier than me, huh, Sir Williams? <laughs> all right. Yeah, guys, just so you know, Greg here. Thanks, Greg. He covered Firewatch all night. Um, so, you guys, some of the work that they've done and they've been doing right quick. Ron's your new supply guy, guys. So when people are coming up with donations, he's running our overflow. This guy here, this is one of the best, best guy. I mean, you guys know how I love Solo. This guy right here. This is one of the best camp dogs we've had. Besides Solo, of course, but... This is Smokey. The I Smoke. He's a Smokey, yeah. The Wolf Shepherd hybrid. The dog is awesome. Uh, we started. They were cooking. Let's see where they're at. We got the hash browns going. Uh, towards the end of the month, most of them are out of food stamps. The food goes fast because I have a standing order. Hey, if they're hungry, cook. Constantly cook and feed everybody. Let me show you what they've done in here. They actually did a really good job. They came in and ripped this entire area out. They know how I am with the OCD, so they literally spent, and they spent their time just turning cans, make sure all labels are out. And <laughs> I know you can't see it too good in here, it might be dark, but um, food-wise, non-perishable, as you can see, they're good. It's just uh, having milk, um, eggs, and cheese. And remember, we can keep food cold. We do have some bigger coolers, and it's winter time. Um, but milk, eggs, cheese, uh, we got a bunch of pancake stuff. That's a really good breakfast. It doesn't cost much, but um, their water supply, you see, is getting kind of low. I'll get a post of the empty pallet out so we can let people know. And uh, let's see. I think we have 36 veterans here. When Ben gets up, we'll have another count. But I think we have 36 veterans here. And we were two over on civilians because of the families. But if you guys remember how the old supply tent was down when I, when I left and all we had was all that stuff. Well, this is it, guys. This is their supply tent. Uh, BOP President Ken Champ said, you know, we just need kind of like an overflow. And so uh, we set it up. So as fast as the donations come in now, a lot of them, they don't even get back here to get sorted. They go right out to the front. There's John's, uh, Pastor John's Chapel right there. They built. We'll go check that out for you guys too. This guy here built the chapel. <laughs> so this is John's office. They wanted to build him something. He does a lot for these guys out here, you know. And um, you know, they, they they have a lot of respect and you know for everything he does. And they wanted to build him this little this little chapel area. And it's night chapel per Mama B. We reversed it. It's uh, something with words she knows more than I do. But uh, we were actually talking about Batman this morning. We we're going through old videos of Salt River PD and some of these guys. Uh, overall, I mean they they're doing good. We've been kicking ass in this mission since day one because since the very day we've operated there has not been one day in almost two and a half years that we have not had homeless veterans sleeping safely under our watch not a single day every night guys you go to bed all these people have a safe place to sleep you're doing something right now um, you've been doing something for two years and as long as we keep doing what we're doing, every night when we go to our own homes, other people will be blessed who wouldn't have a home because of that. And to me, that's like the greatest thing. When you, when you come and you wake up here in the morning with these guys, you know, it's, I don't know, it's just great. Man, we're blessed, you know, and we're blessed so much because there's not another shelter like this in the United States of America. There's not another place where anyone can come in and just be so open and free and actually get to know the people living there. And all these people are being taken care of, and no one's making money off of them. No one's getting any, no poverty pimps involved. You know, it's, then they're starting to take care of themselves. I don't know where Lewis ran off to. Say good morning. Say good morning, Rod. Good morning. Sarge, say good morning. Everybody. Good morning, morning. Say good morning. Good morning. All the camp moms, I'd like to say thank you for your ongoing support of us. Thank you guys for everything. 
You can watch the video from the beginning. I'll be out here at camp as usual. And uh, come on out. And if you're coming out, uh, pick up some eggs, please, because they're out of eggs. All right? I love you guys. God bless you. Have a great day. All right?